drag race and million dollar listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hello and welcome to the WOW Report. We're coming to you almost live from Hollywood, California, Hollywood Boulevard, the headquarters of World of Wonder. And it's Tom Campbell, Chief Creative Officer. I'm here. He's in control now. I am in control. I'm kind of power, <laughs> power hungry. Because Fenton is here. He's back. Yay. I can't talk. But he has a cold. So we're going to do <laughs> perhaps the first radio broadcast where you can't hear one of the participants. I can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make you sing 99 <laughs> bottles of beer on the wall and see how far you get. <laughs> so James, St. James, uh, club kid turned best-selling author, is here. Welcome to my voice. So we're going to speak doubly as loud. No, I promise we won't. Um, as we do what we do every week, which is count down the top 10 things that make us go, wow. So because every <laughs> syllable is precious, a precious commodity, Fenton, we're going to jump right into it, shall we? <laughs> Starting with number 10. Number 10. Guys, have you, we have not talked about, I believe, on the show, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Oh. It's so weird because I feel we have, but we actually haven't. We it's haven't. Been you, like you, have you seen it at all? You saw one I saw episode. the pilot episode, yeah. And? Mm, not for me. Okay. Really? Yeah. Well, because to me, it seems like right up my alley. It's, yes. it's like really fabulous early 60s, late 50s fashions. Yes. It's like really great, you know, Technicolor. It looks yes. like it's sparkly and fun. And it's sort of the Joan Rivers story is what I guess. It's a little bit. And it's it's Amy Sherman Palladino and her husband, Daniel I love Palladino. I some Amy Sherman Palladino. Gilmore Girls, which was an acquired taste. People, It's, it's that same kind of patter, the, yeah, the patter, speechifying of dialogue. his gal Friday. Yes. yes. Um, and, it, and it was. Now, I saw the first season, but not until I, I was on vacation in August, and it felt too long to talk about. How many seasons have we done? It's, they've just <laughs> dropped the second season, which is why I thought it was timely to bring it up here on this week's podcast. But, wait, but, the, but the takeaway from the second season yes. is that on the third episode, you see some full frontal male nudity. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yeah, that's what everyone, that's what uh, the people are, are talking to me about. I'm getting <laughs> That's what's on James's Twitter feed. Um it stars, and she won. You know, she won all the Oscar, uh, uh, the Emmys. Emmy, yeah. Well, um, the the wonderful uh, Rachel Brosnahan. Brosnahan. I can't do names. And she is the standard of the show. But it's also Tony Shalhoub, who's amazing. Uh huh. Um, Marin Hinkle. Okay. A name you don't know, but she played the wife. It's it's Charlie Sheen, on 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 uh, Two and a Half Men. It was Charlie Sheen and. The other one, John, John Cryer. Cryer. John Cryer had an ex-wife who was always oh yeah, she was that's hysterical. Her. Yeah, and she is such a different. She plays the mother, and she's very Upper West Side, fastidious. You know, measures herself, Jewish woman. And Alex Bornstein, who is the best actress on from every, Mad TV, from right? Mad oh, TV, right, and sure. she was on 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 getting uh, the HBO thing about the old age home. She's just amazing, and she plays this kind of lesbianic. Uh, you know, <laughs> village, um, the manager who's just like lives in squalor but believes in her. And it's, it's, it's basically about a, a Jewish woman in the, in the late 50s who's breaking into the comedy scene. Yes. It's, it's a male dominated industry and she's breaking boundaries. Yes. And you think that's all it is, mm -hmm. but it's so much more. Okay. Because the first season kind of ends, she, and they cross, it's all fictional, but they cross it over with like Steve Allen references or they have a character that plays Lenny Bruce who befriends her and she got thrown in jail and stuff. So the first, ep the first season kind of of ramps up and you get to know her family and she lives with her family she has kids she has a husband that wanted to be a comedian but he wasn't funny enough and so she took over and that's what broke them up and at the end of the first season you think she's going on the road she's ready for success and what's wild about the second season is it, that's how the second season ends like she's ready to go on the road they stop and they tell all these different stories it starts off in paris i'm not giving i'm not spoiler alerting anything but her mother has kind of like a midlife crisis and just moves to Paris. We're like, where's mom? Didn't she tell you where she was going? Oh, mom lives in Paris now. So there's like an episode or two in Paris, and it's lovely. And then at some point, it's um, the summer, and they go to the Catskills, you know, which has comedy and stuff too. But it's like, and this exploration of her uh, her estranged husband, and he works in the garment district with his parents. And it just, it's really rich in texture it's really rich in relationships and at the same time it is overspun and over you know it's it's surreal but it kind of goes fast and slow and you know you can sit there and i can kind of judge it. i've seen every one and i've watched them probably in four settings like 20 episodes so there's something kind of hypnotic about it and i really like it and the fun little tidbit which you said is is especially first season and i think they've now are building within their own world but it was joan rivers was married 
before. She was like a nice girl from uh, Westchester. She was married. She was going to do fine. And she married a guy for a very short time, divorced him, and started her comedy r her mm, career. So mm -hmm. there's even one picture where she's wearing like the clothes, the yeah, hats, yeah, wow. and the capes. And she's like a clothes horse. They've made her like the daughter of rich people, so there's a reason that she can dress like this. But it's it's a little over the top. And, and I finally, I'm, I've grown so much, you guys. Let's just take a minute to talk <laughs> I, about it. I've been <laughs> saying that about you. Every time Tom's <laughs> yes. name comes thick, out, thick, I says thick, he's thick, really thick. grown. Uh, oh. be because <laughs> I, I am such a stickler my mind used to be sharper but like if you are doing a show so shot in 1959 and that song is from 1961 oh, oh right don't oh, go yeah. there girl mm -hmm. they mess with timeline a little bit but i don't care um mm -hmm. i'm saying watch it it's again if, if have you watched it i have not no he has lots of opinions about it <laughs> but he <hasn't laughs> as always <laughs> everybody loves it the but. marvelous mrs mazel it's 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 a fun little Excursion. Little, little, little uh, amuse, bou uh, bouche, amuse bouche, oh, oh, whatever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Things about nature. What have you got, James, at number nine? Yeah. Number nine. I watched some Netflix <laughs> over the weekend. I did um, uh, <laughs> Dumplin'. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to Dumplin'. I've heard a lot about Dumplin'. Yeah, yeah. It's Dumplin' is based on Julia Murphy's 2015 young adult novel. It stars an Australian girl named Danielle McDonald who plays Willow Dean Dixon. Who steals the show. Steals presumably. the show. She's absolutely fantastic. She's um, sort of a, a big girl. She's uh, a big actress. Um, sort of like in the Honey Boo Boo, like yeah. all grown up. And her breakout was last year. What was that movie? Yeah, she did. Um, uh, I, saw, I went to see that in the theater. Patty. Yeah. P Patty Cakes. Patty, Patty Cakes. Cakes. Yeah. She's so good. Yeah. And she plays um, the daughter of Jennifer Aniston, who is uh, old, who is an aging beauty queen and a vain, superficial woman who is sort of clinging to her youth, still goes around dressed in her tiara and beauty queen outfit. And um, the daughter decides to become a beauty, enter the beauty pageant, enter the town beauty pageant is sort of a protest, saying like a big girl can be in a, in a beauty pageant. And uh, she does it to sort of piss off her mom, and her mom is pissed off. But then eventually, it becomes sort of a life affirming thing. Like we can all be beauty queens. We can all, you know, there's there's it's more than skin deep. All there's a bunch of other big girls join the pageant, and. Uh, but the interesting thing, the takeaway, is that she has this uh, aunt who is now deceased, and we see in flashbacks that the aunt is sort of this anti mame character, and the aunt uh, introduces her to the world of drag, and they go to a drag bar, a southern drag bar, and by God, who is there? But Ginger Minge yes. is one of the contestants, and um, the drag queen sort of teach her to you know about self acceptance and self love, and that anybody can be fabulous and that whole thing. So it's 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 interesting. It's a good. Um, I hear Ginger Minge is a, a scene stealer whenever she's on screen. Well, can I admit something? Yes, I haven't really watched that far. <gasps> Jen. Finally, truth is being told. <laughs> I, I got, you could have gotten away with it, too. I, know, I almost got away with it, too. I was really worried. <laughs> I've only seen 20 minutes. <laughs> Just too now, honest. What's Dolly Parton's part, or is that later? Well, is that later in the film as well? <laughs> no, no, no. How are no. the first 10 minutes? I guess is what we want to no, know. The, the, it's all told through. The, the soundtrack is all Dolly Parton songs. Thank you. And Dolly has actually contributed two, song, two new songs, one or two new songs. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I sure. have no idea. People are going to believe you. It's, it's like Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> say whatever we want. Just with, say it with conviction. Well, and also a good friend of WoW that's also in this movie, Sam Pancake. Oh, there you go. Maybe I'll... There's a lot to look forward to, James. <laughs> there is, there is. Um, but uh, the, the, one of the reviews, that it's gotten 50-50 reviews. 50, you know, some people love it, some people play 50 it. 50 people watched it, 50 people didn't. <laughs> 50 people got through 20 minutes. Um, but they were saying that it actually makes you grow tired of Dolly Parton. What? <laughs> like, it's heresy, but it's true that by the end, you're like, Please, no more dolly. Well, no more I guess dolly. In your case, just twenty minutes. <laughs> did you did you stop because you fell asleep? Were you bored, or were you just busy? Um, I <clears throat> did, the, did the radio show begin? You were just like watching. <laughs> I, I, I like literally started it at three thirty-five this afternoon. <laughs> oh, uh, no, I am. I'm going to go back and finish it tonight. But um, uh, yeah. If you're looking for reviews from people that haven't watched the shows, come here to the Wow Report. All right, now we count down to something I hope Fenton has seen or read or perused or thought about a little bit at number eight, Fenton. Number eight. You know, I actually have watched this. Um, it's like a 10 hour series on HBO and I'm on hour seven. Okay. So I've got three more hours to go. Okay, truth, tr it, transparency, it's like, it's thank you. It's good succession. And basically, it's the story of the Murdochs, but in a sort of oh. <clears throat> minimally fictionalized version. So basically what happens is 
old patriarch of massive media company. In fact, it begins in total darkness. And it's like, oh, <clears throat> where the fuck I, am I? I'm really turned on by this, it's, by your voice. I'm just loving phantom. this. It's quite good for this. And he's uh -huh. staggering around in the dark. You can't see anything. And then you hear, pss, 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 and he's peeing on the floor. And that's how the whole thing begins with this very this old. This is on man. PBS? HBO. HBO. Oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I have a little video. God damn, baby, repeat myself. <laughs> I'll translate and for you. And it's basically, oh, it's got a fantastic theme song, which is really good. And it, he, he has a brain hemorrhage in the first episode. So the whole family thinks he's dead. Or gonna die. And is so that why he was peeing on the floor? Who's gonna? Yeah, he's old, old, oh. old. I he's never peed on the floor. <laughs> as if, like, How old is have Rupert Murdoch? On the... He's almost ninety, right? Sure. I mean, and so who's gonna take over the family farm? And none of the children are really suitable. You know, as you might expect, they're not really right. capable. It's really dark. Oh, and the other thing about it is that, unbeknownst to any of the kids, yeah. they're sitting on a mountain of debt. The company's up to its eyes in debt. Sounds familiar, right? And the other thing is they have a huge string of sexual harassment oh. lawsuits well, wait, waiting no, to explode. What, what I'm not understanding, is this an actual story of Rupert Murdoch or is it a no, fictionalized? it's a fictionalized. So, there, so the Rupert... Thinly veiled. Right, okay. The veiled. Lachlan and uh, the kids are... Yeah, all they've all got ridiculous names like okay. Kendall and <laughs> Roman and things like that. Okay. And there's a daughter who is a little bit like... Is, is there a Jerry this. Hall? Does she come in in the later <clears throat> episodes? Well, there's a younger exotic wife who I suppose was more like Murdoch's... When, Wendy uh, Murdoch. Wendy Dang. Wendy yeah. Dang, yeah. Uh -huh. And she, so far, has just played the, the dutiful caretaker, but you have a feeling. Oh, there's you can more just of the story. That there's a past. Because there's one point where she says, check the price of the stock, and it's completely out of character. It comes out of nowhere, and you're like, got to watch this one. Yeah. She's up to something. And there's also a sort of cousin of the family who's an imposter. It's really good. It's really dark. Everybody in it is a complete asshole, okay. which I don't really normally like, actually. You know, it's too dark. It's okay. It doesn't feel like home to you. No, I mean, there's no drag queens or, you know, <laughs> Have you festive. seen the Tracy Almond show that's currently runs? No, I haven't. Because she does amazing characters, and one of them, she does the whole Murdoch family. And, oh. she, and she plays Jerry Hall. Like, oh, <laughs> like take a picture, everybody. <laughs> so, um, so Succession is on HBO, but I'll tell you who's in it, who's really good. Yeah. Kieran Culkin. Oh, I've been hearing about this. Yeah. Yes. It's a now I know exactly wrong. what you're talking about. Yes. And he's actually been nominated for Golden Globe. Macaulay's brother. Yes. yes. Who is the, the handsome younger brother. I, I love me some Kieran Culkin. There's a very HBO scene where Kieran Culkin, who's been out of the family business, gets the chief operating officer position, you know, because that's what you do, I guess. And he comes into his office, he draws the blinds, and then at the window, he pulls down his pants and jerks off onto the glass. Yes! He cuts away, and the next scene, he's like wiping cum off the glass of the window of his massive office tower. Only on HBO. <laughs> no, I have heard, been hearing <laughs> wonderful things about Kieran's performance. He steals every scene. He's really good. I mean, the only yeah. problem is he's an asshole. The, the character he plays is a total, it's total hot, asshole. Though, yeah. I don't know. It's too much, maybe. I don't know. Will you watch the, the, the final three? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And in. it's, it's uh, oh, Adam McKay, I think, is the creator. He did Vice, mm. the new movie mm, about yeah. uh, Cheney. Yes, an Anchorman. So it's kind of it's a bit of funny. Well, that's sort of a weird right. to go to Anchorman to Vice. Yeah. Nice combo. Well, it's, uh, Vice is supposed to be funny. Is I it think. darkly funny? Huh. Noir. Yeah, yeah. Good okay. Is there a little now, bit of humor in this? There is. Yeah, because everyone's so sort of incompetent, you know, <laughs> except for the the patriarch. Isn't it Michelle Obama who said on her recent book tour, maybe it's in her book, which I have but I haven't read all of, where she's like, I've been is this a running the, theme? I've been at the table with some of the most powerful people in the world, and they're not that smart. Actually, <laughs> that is a perfect <laughs> summation of the series. Yes. Okay, good. Now, is this set in New York? Yes, it is. Well, that's set awesome. in New York, I guess in the present, really, basically. Right. Awesome. We're going to take a little break so Fenton can rest his voice, <sighs> and so you can stay glued. We're going to do a little uh, trivia question. Yeah. Blake, what do you got? Is this... Yes, I changed it. Because, you know, this is one of the last episodes of the year. They were ever going to do. So I <laughs> well, don't <laughs> <laughs> You never know. <laughs> so, okay, so looking ahead. Yes. What is Pantone's color of the year for 2019? What is I know Pantone's this. color of the year for 2019? That, the answer to that and a lot more fun stuff when we return. You're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy Sirius XM. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. 
Okay, welcome back to the Wow Report. It's Tom Campbell. I'm here with James St. James, Ooh. Fenton Bailey, who is his sucking on a lo lozenge <sighs> right now. And of course, behind the scenes, helping us every step of the way, Blake, hello. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Happy holidays. <laughs> Happy days. Uh, before the break, Fenton asked us, what is the Pantone color of the year? Something you look forward to, like... You know, I stay up. Well, I, you know, <laughs> listen, I, I get excited because I get to I change my entire wardrobe every year. Yeah, so from into, black to black. <laughs> and I try and, uh, to get some wallpaper to match and, and just really go bananas. Get some wigs that are that color. I also I love it because it's endlessly debatable. Mm -hmm. right. People can sort of react. And I happen to know what it is. Do you know what it is? I think I know. Do you know oh. what it is? Uh, I can guess. Go ahead. Green. No. Uh, no, that was the color last year, actually. Yeah, before. Yeah. The, yeah. the emerald. Yeah. It yeah. is. It's, the, it's, it is. it's cranberry. No, Living no. coral. Living oh, coral. Oh, the coral. The, or, yeah, so the they're coral. making a political statement, right? Because it's about the coral reef. Which are being bleached. So they're not living coral they're like dead white right but the interesting thing about a coral is that it's red but it has a little orange in it so yes. not everybody can pull it off well it's interesting because on qvc they say the coral which never seems to sell out is it's a color that goes with every color skin it is tone. it does but i thought coral was the in color a few years ago they, so they go no, around the same the, palette, there was the they? um what was it the Lavin radiant the, there was the radiant violent uh, purple yeah there was violent radiant purple. radiant yeah something and then there was the emerald and then there was oh. a br the brown it was like a um, like a burgundy a few years ago a masala masala mm. yes yes uh -huh. well, guys, I hate to interrupt this, oh, yes. this, this Fascinating. trite conversation <laughs> but I'm here to save lives and to save the world at number seven number seven pizza is the number one addictive food says who a study, <laughs> several <laughs> studies actually. Yale studies. There was this big piece on but CNN. About a big piece, a pizza, <laughs> a, slice, <laughs> a big slice of a story. <laughs> I'm rereading a lot. But in a recent study, pizza was ranked as the most associated with symptoms of addiction, according to the Yale Food Addiction Scale, a tool that accesses the di assesses, excuse me, the diagnostic criteria for substance use disorders in reference to highly processed foods. I thought my meth muffins were the most addictive. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> what is a meth muffin? It's muffins that you sprinkle a little meth on top. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and they instead said, of confectioner sugar. She's not kidding. There's a psychological <laughs> response to it. It's partially explained by the highly processed foods like pizza and with added amounts of fat, refined carbohydrates, and salt are most associated with behavior indications of addiction. I say this because I'm coming out of the closet, if, you, like you guys know. Oh, yeah. I am the pizza Surprise! <laughs> there was a moment, like, I don't know, five or six years ago, it wasn't as long as you think, where I had gotten down to, like, my lowest weight. And we were working with Rue, and I was at Rue's house, and, like, at a casual event, and I had my legs crossed, and he was, like, looking at you. It's like when I met you in the 90s. And that was Thanksgiving, and I went home and ordered a pizza, and I've been gaining weight <laughs> since. All it takes you is that. You just can't take a compliment, can all you? It, it's, just, it's that one, like, you made it. Like, yeah, okay, you thought you finally made I it. I was thin for a day. Um, um, it supposedly has the perfect combination of ingredients. That cr It's called the Holy Trinity of crust, cheese, and sauce, that it gives you that <sighs> whole umami thing. I'm just saying, because I love pizza so much. I always have. And it's 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 and you know it it, it makes you do things that you wouldn't normally do, which is like you're like this is bad for me, but I'm gonna get one anyway. I laugh <laughs> at nine o'clock at night <laughs> as I'm peeking out the window waiting for the Domino's man to show up. Are you really? Yes. Pizza Hut. You like Pizza Hut and Domino's? You like those pizzas? Domino's is queen. It's there. Wait, do you like, yeah, between Pizza Hut, uh, Little Caesars, and Domino's, which is I don't it. think I can get the others to deliver, or I would. I'm, I'm the problem talking about it. I want to be home tonight with all three of those cars. Like See, outside I, I love a Little Caesars because that to me is is my, my Michigan Midwest. That's what we had, and I still can. That's comfort food to me. What about Village Pizza in Larchmont? Uh, uh, but they're also saying that people will kind of like drug addiction. People will mm. eat any kind of pizza. Like, of course, you have your favorite, like you know, matzah pizza and your fancy, but you'll eat Domino's. Matzah you'll pizza. Put, matzah is that great place on uh, oh, Melrose God. and Highland. That pizza is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's breathtaking. It's voice taking. You sound like a pizza perv. <laughs> but also, I can understand this because there was a study that said cheese is highly addictive, yes. as addictive and as you crack are. Cocaine. Cheese addict. Yeah, we actually yes. talked about that earlier in the year yes. about how. How addictive cheese was. Mm -hmm. See, but now I'm. See, I am a sweet person. I like my cookies, sweet. my chocolate, my. Oh. I, yeah, I need my Milano cookies every night. Right? I need both. From from Gail Vance Seville, founder and president of the Sensory Spectrum, 
a consulting <laughs> firm that helps companies, including pizza companies, learn how sensory cues drive consumer per uh, perceptions of products. She goes, I'm fascinated by the fact that people will eat almost any kind of pizza, not necessarily the best pizza. And part of that is the fact that it is the uber selection of ingredients that have fat, sugar, and salt that pleases the amygdala, a set of neurons in the brain that makes the brain very happy. It delivers on the food matrix uh, that people tend to crave and want and then feeds the brain, which says, this is just wonderful. So I'm. it's not my fault. How many times a week do you eat pizza? Oh, my God. I try not to, <clears throat> thinking I'm doing better if I don't eat it, but then I'll just eat other, you know, mm -hmm. anytime I order in food you're from a restaurant, you're getting too many or calories. Or if you go for salt. a week without, you, you'll congratulate yourself by yes. doing it two nights in a row or something. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so... I don't know, and, and I heard something on NPR years ago. Maybe I talked about this, but there's like, there's like nine out of ten people have had a had a piece of pizza this month, at least a piece of pizza. I believe like that. Like everybody eats pizza. It's it's cheap. It's available. It makes you happy. It's happening. So I remember my father, um, the first time he had pizza, where he was a teenager, he was in his twenties, I think, because they didn't bring pizza back until after World War II. That was when oh, it really. Okay. Uh, sort of took off and so the first time he had pizza was in the 1950s and the cheese slid off his face And it gave him second-degree burns all the way down his neck and he I, still still pizza love. I know that's horrible and he lived the rest of his life as a monster um, I can also tell you the very po popular pizza chain in England called Pizza Express. Yes Was founded in something like the early 70s and he just died Oh, yes Way to bring it down. I feel, like, I feel like we should stop making television into a world of one to pizza because it's addictive. It's great. People will buy it. We'll put an orange box. Let's do it. All Have right. RuPaul skate out and give yeah. it to you. I, I will check back in with you when I find a cure or a treatment for my pizza addiction. But right now, I'm just admitting I have a problem. I think you're that's wallowing the in it is that's what you're beginning. doing. Yeah, I'm starving. All right, we are now at the most important part of the uh, countdown. Number six. Number six. Number six, of course. Um, I watched uh, American Meme. Do you guys know what this is? Did you I really saw watch a it? little I did. something. Yeah, um, documentary it's, about uh, influencers. Yeah, it's on Netflix. It purports to be a deep dive into the world of social media stars and social media influencers. Um, it, what drives them, what defines them, what the sociological implications of it are. You think that it's going to be a lot more uh, intellectual than it is. Um, Thank God. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, I mean. Says the shallow one. No, but you, you, you sort of, I mean, like, we all know who, who they are and Where everything. Are they? Well, that's the Beautiful. problem with this is that it just does the, the t t tippy top people who, who are uh, Paris Hilton, the fat Jew, Brittany Furlong, uh, DJ Khalid, supermodel Emily Roger Howitz. Um, I, I don't know how to pronounce her name. And uh, Kirill, Kirill, do you know who that is? The uh, slut shamer, the slut, the slut whisperer. I think is his name. That's a lot of uh -uh. people to follow in one film. Well, what? we do. That's that's what happens. Is it, we just get a very superficial overview of how they became famous and what they're famous for. Um, you know, the fat Jew does a lot of memes, and he does. Uh, uh, he's he's famous for stealing them and not giving people credit for them is sort of what his his problem is. <laughs> Brittany Furlon does like little. She was famous on Vine, which was you know the six second thing. She's the only one I haven't heard of. I don't. Well, think. she was here. Uh, we met her on um, Thursday night at the Wowies. We gave her an award. Oh. She came. She was absolutely delightful. She does. Well, never um, mind. I know her. She does comedy. She's, oh, oh, no, she's yeah. really cute. I didn't know who she was until I met her, and I had to pretend <laughs> I knew who she was. I was like, Oh my god, it's Brittany Furlong! And I like did this whole thing. <laughs> so um, it was a teaching moment. It is. Uh, most despicable of voice. all of these, though, is Kirill, who is the slut, slut, uh, whisperer. Slut, slut whisperer. And he basically, um, he, he throws parties every night, and he and naked women come, and he dunks their head in toilets and, and pours champagne all over them and sprinkles, puts sprinkles on them. And he's really, it's, he's really vile, and he <laughs> talks a lot about how people don't want to get to know him and all. They just want to party with him, and you're supposed to feel sorry for him. It, um, how can that even be someone in 2008? Yeah. Well, that's just it. Like the fact that he still exists <laughs> is is very weird. But he does have a following, like sort of like Girls Gone Wild. The bros it's like he love traveled him. from the year two thousand five. Exactly. Today. Yeah. Um, basically, the takeaway is um, that. Uh, we all want validation, and the fans give it to you, and blah blah blah. And we're, you know, Paris Hilton wants us to all feel sorry for her because her life is just she's not she's, great. She's been doing the same thing since she was twenty years old, and she's now thirty-seven or however old. And she, you sort of, 
What living I, I her best life? I wanted more from this series than I got. I thought, oh, it's a series. No, no, I mean it was just, it's just it's a, a one-off. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, mean, I, I wanted more from this than I got. I saw on the ascent and some on the decline. I mean, um, I guess Paris. I I just assume Paris is on the decline. No, no. That, that's the thing is that these people all look up to Paris as a goddess and they all Pioneer. aspire to be her. And she still is. She's at you know 300 million <laughs> followers and this internationally. And I think she's super hot. Yeah, but you don't discount the fact that there are 14 year old girls who still look to Paris as a, as an I idol. I'd be surprised even if I she do. Is. Oh, yeah. Well, there you have it. I mean, the whole thing. The, the, like I said, I wanted it to be more of a deep dive into what it is that 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 makes someone a social media star and how it is to become a social media star. And instead, we just got DJ Khalid walking around. Why don't you jot down podcast ideas for James St. James <laughs> explores <laughs> social media stars? Take note of that. I see a future for you. Okay. I still can't Give understand. It a it's free. DJ oh. Khalid. I don't understand DJ Khalid either. I, just don't I don't. Get I don't understand it. a lot yeah. of these people. I don't understand the fat Jew. I don't understand. I don't think we're supposed to. Is, is it because we're old? Is that what it is? A little tiny bit. Do you understand? Uh, not really. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I really don't get. I mean, I like a lot of DJ Khalid songs or Khaled songs, but why? Not because of him. It's because Beyonce is on it. But you know or... his, but his his um, Instagram stories and his YouTube videos and everything of him. You know, you see him every day wandering around his mansion and he's a dad. And but he's he not some but Weight he, Watcher but, ads. Uh, That's where I really got connected with him. <laughs> <laughs> we both love pizza. I don't find I don't find him compelling. Right. On that up note, we will. The American Meme is now streaming on Netflix. I would say, wow, don't go watch it based on, on that review. <laughs> um, but now we have reached number five in Fenton Bailey, who has a terrible throat cold. Number five. I was faced with a choice at a difficult age. Would I write a book or should I take to the stage? But in the back of my head, I heard distant feet. Che Guevara and Debussy to a disco beat. Is this Dr. Seuss? Who's that? Do you know who that is? Oh, okay. it's Mark Allman, isn't and it? I'll give you one more. I feel like taking all my clothes off and dancing to the rite of spring. I wouldn't normally do this kind of thing. It's Mark Bronson. Bronson. It's the Pet Shop Boys. The oh, Pet Shop Boys. Yeah. Neil uh -huh. Tennant has published a book of his lyrics. It's a hundred lyrics and a poem. And it's basically the lyrics from the Pet Shop Boys songs, which he has written. And um, I, I always have a soft spot for the Pet Shop Boys. Yes, you do. You know, I always think if like, if, Earl Grey wasn't a T, but was a pop star, it would be Neil Tennant. Mm -hmm. They're like very sort of posh and so I had dinner with them last year. Did you? Yeah. Oh, what the hell? Um, they were big fans of Party Monster, yes. and they had been trying to meet me for a long time, and someone set it up, and we went and had dinner at what? Uh, Off Vine over there. Both of them? Yeah. What about me? What, you didn't invite me? No, I didn't invite you. Didn't tell us about it? Didn't no. you go to Giorgio's after that or something? What? No, I met them at Georgia. No, I met them at... Um, I the week before, we met at... Uh, <laughs> what's Avita? the other place? I don't know. Boulay's. Uh, Queen Kong before Queen Kong, a club downtown. Yeah, anyway. we, we, we yeah we we met and <laughs> then we we. Well, what did we, you talk about? Well, uh, me <laughs> mostly. <laughs> <laughs> what does James usually talk about <laughs> when he goes out? <laughs> um, and yeah. I was trying not. And what to, did they say? Well, I was trying not to be a fan girl, so I was trying not to to be to to be. So tell me about West End girls. I I was trying not to do uh -huh. that kind of conversation. Let me tell you about myself. <laughs> I mean, Breakfast I, this morning, <laughs> just <laughs> toast with a little jam. But I, I mean, Neil is terribly posh, isn't he? He's very, yeah, no, he's very dry. He's yes. very, and the other one um, is almost silent. But he's but he's a little he when he starts talking, he's a little gushier and and he will he's cute. He's really adorable. Right, right, right. Yeah. Now, well, I know yes. you love them. Yes. I know there's a book. But just tell yes. I, is this just lyrics on paper? Are there pictures? <laughs> like what's going on? How well, big is it? Is it paperback? Is it it's hardcover? It's a slim volume. Yes. It's very minimal. It's I like, like all that stuff. I like that. And I mean, I think their songs are so great. It's like dance songs to be listened to. And I think also their lyrics are sort of work perfectly well being right. read. Yep. Well, um, wait, oh, just very quickly. Yes. What, um, what is your favorite song? I think my favorite Pet Shop Boys song, I mean, it's several, but Rent is one of them. Mm. I love you, you pay my rent. And Young Offender. I love Young Offender. It's for you, James. You're younger than me, obviously. Will I get in your way or open your eyes? Who will goof whom? The bigger <laughs> surprise. I mean, 
there's a reviewer wrote, uh, the Pet Shop Boys' sexuality was somewhat coded at the time. I mean, mm. let's be honest, they were they were in the closet, really. Yeah. They were, but, uh, Even but we still so knew West camp. End Boy, or, I mean, yes. West End Girl, what was it? Yes, boy West End Boys, West yeah. End boys. I yes, ran out and bought that. It, it was, there was West a, End Girls, sorry. There yeah. was a sound when they arrived, it's mm. hard to explain, mm. space, time, motion, but it was a sound you kind of never heard before, and lyrics and a, and a sensuality. And it, was, it was an insider. You felt like yes. you, were, you were, it was, a, yeah. I was in the closet, too, but I ran out and I bought that 12 inch, and West End, it was just dunk, 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 the sound, yes. the sonics of it were so beautiful. Oh, wait, wait, my two favorites, though. I've got the brains, you've got the brawn, let's make lots of money. Yeah, I love let's make lots of money. I love being born. That's one of my yes. favorite. And suburbia. Let's oh. take a ride tonight in suburbia. And um, what have I? What, what have I? I? What That's have my I? That's my favorite. So With this. Dusty yes. Springfield. Yes. yes. They, were, they, they are amazing. Mm -hmm. I think my favorite, also the song I listen to every time I get on a plane, it's like, you know, it's become a sort of comfort food ritual, is... Uh, Love EDC from um, the album Yes. I don't it's, know. Uh, you need more than the Gerhau director hanging on your wall, a chauffeur driven limousine on call to drive your wife and lover to a white tie ball. You need more, you need more, you need more, you need love. That's your life. Aww. Well, no, not really. Oh, and the <laughs> other, there's a great song on one of their albums, I can't remember which it's called. Um, where they, they sort of talk about people who hated them. And, and I love this. You have a certain quality which really is unique, expressionless, such irony, although your voice is weak. It doesn't really matter because the music is so loud. Of course, it's all on tape, but no one will find out. It's fabulous. You're still around today. You've both made such a little go a very long way. <laughs> I love it. That's really good, right? And the, there's a poem. Do you want to hear what the poem is? Yes. The poem is... Every day it passes by, the day one year on which I'll die. The date is not revealed to me, it keeps its secret patiently. Yeah. Happy New Year! <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it all sounds a bit doggerly, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like poetry. No, but, the, but that sure is the does. thing about them, is that they're... It's, it's indelible, it, it, it eats <clears throat> into your brain, and you, you never forget them, and... I got you know because being boring to me I hate is you now for having dinner with them and not telling me about this. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Did um, you hook up another dinner? You know, no, we we they, had, they weren't that impressed with me, frankly. You just say you're bringing it, someone interesting it, this time. It didn't go very well. All oh, right. I, yeah, I Why? walked away from it thinking like I didn't really impress them. Should've I wasn't brought, really funny. Should have brought me along. I know, I know. The name of the book again? Oh, uh, one hundred lyrics and a poem. All right. It's in books. Would it make a good good uh, Christmas gift, let's Perfect say? Perfect stocking right. suffer. I love it. Um, I'm just going to jump in with a little plug here that uh, a, a, a New Year's gift from World of Wonder is going to be Backyard Envy, which premieres January 17th at 10 p.m., right after Million Dollar Listing LA. And Backyard Envy is about a group of two luscious gay men and their luscious female friend and their business together and they 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 do high end they're manscapers they're man that's the, they're called and manscapers. they're very handsome aren't they, they are oh my all of them. goodness and one there's something for everybody in that there's show. the mcgee the mcgee a guy named mcgee gareth mcgee, yes. gareth McGee we'll, my goodness we'll put his uh we'll, we'll flash his instagram all their instagram handles will flash on, the, on and the, i hear they're, they're really fun together they just they they sort of bounce off each other and they're hysterical i love what they do they're you know high-end landscapers but i love their relationship more than anything yeah. that's why i watch Yep, All right. So Million Dollar LA is coming back on the third, yeah. January third. Okay, there's, there's lots the of World of Wonder Andy. shows on Bravo that are coming back, so pay I attention. Love it. Now, before we uh, go away for a break, Blake, do you have a little trivia question for us? I do have a little trivia question. Bring it on. What's the best-selling album of 2018, and what's this best-selling soundtrack? That's this year, right? Yes, 2018. Of this year. Best selling album, best selling soundtrack, two different things. Yes. All right, we'll find out the answer to that and so much more when we return to the Rao Report here on Radio Andy Sirius XM. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. And we're back. This is the Wow Report on Radio Andy Sirius XM. I am Tom Campbell. I am here with the wonderful Clubkin. Plumkin. Plumkin. The Plumkin. The Plumkin. The The Plumkin, Pumpkin, Plumkin. James St. James. That's me. And for this segment, uh, we're joined Fenton, at the changed. table. Blake Jacobs has joined us here at the table. Hi, guys. Hi. And let's not forget our millennial producer behind the camera, behind the mic, Fenton. Oh, hi. <laughs> He's still here. He's still here. <laughs> What's um, happening? <laughs> but before the break, uh, we did a quick a little trivia question, and Blake asked us, what is the best-selling album of this year and the best-selling soundtrack? Oh, I'm going to say the best-selling soundtrack is um, A Star is Born. Me too. 
And I'm going to say the best album is um, uh, Five Sauce, Five Seconds of Summer. Or it could be Ariana oh, Grande. Or Ariana, maybe. Or it could be Taylor Swift because she always seems to. Oh, I'm going to say Ariana, but you're going to say you think it's Taylor? Dangerous Woman or Sweetener? I think it's Reputation. Reputation by Taylor okay, Swift. Okay, okay. What's the answer? It is, in fact, Reputation yeah, by Taylor is. Swift. Okay. And I asked the soundtrack because I knew you guys would say you thought it was a Star, a Star is Born. Born. But it's not. But it's actually The Greatest Showman. What? Oh. Yes. And then Black Panther, Panther is second, and A Star is Born is third. I'll be ding dong. Black Panda is a great idea for a movie. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Someone write that down, Black Panda. All right, Blake, you, you're always challenging us, and for that I say... Wow, thank you. Um, <laughs> we are now at number four. Number four. I, you know, James admitted that he didn't watch the whole show that he reviewed this week. Thank you for your honesty. So I have to now come clean too because I was invited to, and I think there were even seats saved for me, but I was just tired and, and home eating pizza, and I didn't go see the Troop Beverly Heels. H E E L S. I yes. get it. Um, a, a Peaches Christ production is an amazing I love drag Peaches queen Christ. from yes. San Francisco. It has nothing to do with Drag Race, except she writes all these amazing parodies, tours them around the country, and she, with Trixie Mattel from RuPaul's Drag Race, uh, were here for a weekend of shows that Randy went to and loved. And I was going to go to, but I didn't, but I found out Blake went. It was so good. Really? Yeah. You, have you ever seen the movie? I've seen bits and pieces of it, but it's not you, one of my, I'm okay. It's a Jelly Long classic. When you was. order your yeah. pizza tonight, also <laughs> order <laughs> True Beverly Hills. Tell me, give, give me, so True Beverly Hills is, is, is Shelly Long at her peak career yes. moment. Yeah. In red hair. Red hair, and she's like the rich bitch, and she is going through a divorce with her husband, Craig T. Nelson, mm. and their daughter, who is a young Jenny Lewis. Okay. Uh. Jenny Lewis is from Rollo Collie, but she was a child actor. She was on tons of stuff. Anyway. Okay. I was pretending I knew who Jenny Lewis was. <laughs> Keep going. So they're getting a divorce. So she f- becomes their troop leader, the little girl's yes. troop leader. So it's it's sort of like uh, Private Benjamin. It's just like oh, she's fish woman. out of water. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and But her outfits are so 80s and so like. Crazy. I love that. It's just so good. And, and there, you know, there's really something about Shelley Long at her peak when Outrageous Fortune and all of those movies. I love. Super funny, super pretty. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. See, this is my Shelley Long movie that I, everyone my age remembers Shelley right. Long as the Phyllis from Troop Beverly Hills. And Rosario is the maid. That's like actually where she got Tori Spelling's first movie. Right, of all a young, time. brown haired, pre braces Tori Spelling. Carly right? Gug- Carla Gugino. Oh, yeah, uh-huh, her sure. first movie of all time. Kelly Martin was in this movie as one of the young girls. Um, all right, you're a, li- you're, a, you're a lifelong fan. This is, we found your sweet spot. So but, Tell us about the parody yes. on Saturday. How did it go? What was it like? Well, Trixie, great? I don't think they could have picked a better Rue girl to have done Phyllis like. First of all, I just think Trixie's freaking hilarious, uh-huh. and she was just perfect for this. Uh, there were also Peaches was awesome. She played Velda, the like lesbian, lesbianish, uh, <laughs> lesbianish troop, troop leader. Have you, have you seen the movie? Oh my gosh! <laughs> and doesn't Fitton's, stop. Doesn't stop having an opinion Fitton's about never it. Never seen it either. Never Don't you feel like we need to go see it now? I'll, I'll go see it. I will go see it. I've, it's always been on my radar. It's just something that I had a cultural blind spot there because I was out, going out every night and I didn't see a lot of movies. But that you period. will absolutely <laughs> freaking love this movie. Like it's yeah. so yeah. You'll okay. get all the '80s references. It's the one that got away. Yeah. But is, for the, you. is the show close to the movie? Yeah, so, oh. I mean, it was basically the movie, and this it, is, is it like a line for line remake of no, it? No, no, no. They like they change just, it, and they throw in, you know, like little shade at the other Rue girls. Like there was a Willem Reed and a Shangela Reed, and it was really good. If if you ever get the chance to see, if it ever tours. Go see it. Well, I think basically it's it's a truism that if you ever get a chance to see a Peaches Christ, exactly. anything, yes. she is so funny and she's such an icon for a reason. I had seen um, the Grey Gardens one, but mm. I've never even seen Grey Garden, so. <laughs> <laughs> Other cultural blind spots. <laughs> I give it up to Peaches Christ because at one time for a little bit, and this is very inside baseball, but there was a divide in the drag community, right? There's the, the, the drag queens that have been around forever, and then there's these RuPaul drag queens, drag queens, but Peaches is one of the first people that brought them together. Yeah. yeah. And so... She, 
so it's they're working side by side. Uh, you know, I think Drag Race helps bring awareness to what she's doing, and she brings her master, you know, comedy parody, which is a, a parody is a, a skill. You know, I also uh, have to give a shout out to Meatball, who is an LA queen. She always does Queen Kong with the Boulay yes. brothers. She was amazing in this. She played Jasmine, the um, African American girl that does Cookie Time. I love it. Jasmine <laughs> okay. is like is like a Scarlett O'Hara to him. It's like she plays Jasmine. <laughs> and this is actually the second uh, like Maggie, like Ilsa like in Maggie. Casablanca. <laughs> the gays love this show. You guys have got to see it. This is actually the second film, right. second stage iteration of this show I've seen in LA in two years. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And something. the woman who played Tasha, the woman who played Jasmine was at both of them. So you might see a celebrity. Thank you, Blake. Now get the hell back behind the microphone. Behind All right, the thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks, Blake. All right. We're moving on now to number three. Number three. Number three, uh, there was an announcement made over the weekend that fascinated me. What's that? Um, uh, Faye Dunaway <laughs> will be... Re no, really. I said it was going to be governmental. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Donald this, Trump. This is equally groundbreaking. Okay. This is fantastic. This Robert. is to talk about your camp classics, right? Okay. <laughs> Faye Dunaway will be returning to Broadway for the first time in 37 years. What was the rush? Her, uh, <laughs> she will be, and she'll be playing Catherine Hepburn in a play called uh, T at Five. Okay. Right? Now, and you start to think to yourself, well, I mean, first of all, this, what's T at five? Well, I'm glad you asked because it was based <laughs> on a play from 2002 that Kate Mulgrew played Catherine Hepburn. Okay. Kate Mulgrew, of course, Red in Orange is the New Black and Captain Janeway from uh, Star Trek. Uh, and Mary Ryan from Ryan's Home. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I remember. I'll go back. <laughs> That's funny. But um, the original production was based on uh, Me, the story of, Cat story of My Life by Catherine Hepburn, okay. which was her autobiography. And it starts in 1938 when she was labeled box office poison. Yes. And she's... Uh, After winning the Oscar, she was at, then yes. labeled box office yeah, poison. Yeah, you know, she couldn't get another movie movie for years mm. and it was uh people thought that she was over and Catherine then, Hepburn yeah. Catherine Hepburn Catherine Hepburn Betty Davis Garbo and Marlena Dietrich were all labeled box office poison same year and they couldn't they thought their careers were over so that's the first half of the play and then the second half of the play is in 1983 when she's had a car accident and she's at home thinking that you know looking back on her life and everything and this version of it is just going to be the 1983 bit so it's just I'm relieved I, I'm know, sorry I, I was trying not to be away. shady yeah. Faye Dunaway playing 20 25. <laughs> well, I mean, Betty Davis did it in Good Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. Remember, she was played 16. And I, she was in that's her why we should learn from our yes. elders. Yeah. Yes. But um, uh, anyway, you know, can Dunaway play Hepburn? <sighs> Is the question that I'm asking you? Almost, forgive me. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> to see Faye Dunaway, I hope she does it as as Molly Dearest. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. You know, when you think about how brilliant she was as Joan Crawford, and she was, it was, at, a it was an uh, iconic, iconic one for the ages. And yet, that's the the, uh, the role that she hates the most. Well, she said it ruined her career. Yeah, she said. It, when I think it made her career. I, I think, think when you so look too. back on Faye Dunaway, <clears throat> you're gonna think Bonnie and Clyde and and Mommy Dearest. And I think those. it was like her comeback, but she didn't know it was a comeback yeah and it's a shame that she she hates it so much but does Faye Dunaway who is such a prickly pear and famous for being a diva and hard to work with does she have the discipline anymore for Broadway is the question because well, that adds to the drama. In a it does. Way, it, it does. It's a bit like when Michael Jackson was going to go, I and mean, like every day you keep. You, that you didn't know. end well. No, it didn't. But <laughs> oh, also, but just being honest, Dunaway did do. If you remember, she was Maria Callas a, about a decade ago in Masterclass like on the road. She she did a touring company she did it on of Broadway. That. Yes. Um. Uh. She played. She was in. Um. Four Broadway shows in 1963. Uh, I think she did four of them. Um, she was also in. Let me see. Where is, what is this? What is this? Oh. All I know is that Faye Dunaway's uh, movie <clears throat> premiere was a thing called The Happening, which was a terrible movie, but it was the theme song was sung by the Supremes, The Happening. Oh. Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> I was just vamping while you were looking at oh. the information. Was well, she um, starred in um, uh, the 19 original production of A Man for All Seasons on Broadway, which Impressive. was interesting in 1962. In 1964, she was in Arthur Miller's After the Fall, But For Whom Charlie and The Changeling. So, and then but the for last, whom Charlie? But for whom Charlie? Yes, by <laughs> Thomas Middleton. And then in 1982, she started in the Curse of an 
aching heart. So she has had some some Broadway experience. I don't know. I'm just fascinated by this story. I think it's fascinating to think of. Will you go to Broadway to to watch Faye Dunaway? Is that something you'll do? A hundred percent. Thank you. Thank I, you. I have, can I just have the last word in this one? Yeah. La La Land. That was really <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oscars. Wait, 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 no, no, no. I'm going to have the last word here because have you seen her Gucci ads? Have you seen the Gucci? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, she looks really I mean, awesome. she really still has it. She has a glamour she that does. nobody else ha on the planet has anymore. I'm so glad she's still with us. I saw Elaine May, who's 80 something, playing yeah. on Broadway, so it can be done. Uh, I wish her the best of luck. Well, I, I, I'm going to gobble up some tickets. And I Michelle think... Visage. <clears throat> Oh my God. Is what? <laughs> Michelle Visage is on the West End, and he's saying that she's in her 90s. <laughs> Faye Dunaway has to go to Broadway because I hear in LA there's no car service that will transport her. Oh, <laughs> we're holding back so, some. Uh, well, tea. you know, Randy, Philly Randy was here because his story about filming Faye Dunaway is interviewing her is it's very difficult it's a classic it's one for the wait, ages wait i don't think i don't from, think from american horror, american fashion machine yeah wait was that what it was called american fashion yeah let's hope that faye has had Something some kind of awakening and she's ready to come back and uh, oh. get some action. all right faye dunaway on <clears throat> broadway i can't wait let's move on to fenton bailey and number two remember for those of you just tuning in fenton has a very bad cold number two <laughs> so, I was invited to, um, you know, when the Oscar season comes around, all the documentaries do these campaigns for your consideration. And they have these screenings at theaters, darling, with Q&As. And I was asked to host one for this movie, Shirkers, that's humble, on Netflix. Humble brag. Continue. This documentary. I know, but unlike James St. James, I was obliged to actually watch the documentary. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if I was going to host the thing, and I hadn't watched it, so I watched it. I first opened it up and said, I can't do it. And then, so I did it. And it's by uh, director Amy Tan, and she grew up in Singapore in the early 90s. She was like 19 in 1992. And she was really into punk zines and that whole sort of uh, emo. What, what was that period, James, of the 90s? What do you call it? Um, uh, grunge sort of. Oh, yeah. well, you post grunge. grunge. There was sort like of, a X. <clears throat> sort of new wave. Yes. Yes. So she was this sort of disaffected youth. And Singapore is a very conservative, straight laced society. But her and her friends met this mysterious married man who befriended them. And of course, you immediately start thinking this is going to become some sort of abuse story. And in fact, it is, but it's very unexpected because they decide to make a film, a sort of indie, this is the birth of early indie cinema. Um, and they make this film, they self-finance this film. And this guy directs it. He's like a, he's like a, a, a sort of um, <clears throat> film school teacher very charismatic, somewhat creepy, somewhat elusive, and he directs this movie, and Amy Tan wrote it and stars in it, and they scraped all their money together. Where do you think this story's going? I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> they scraped all the money together, and then when they'd finished, he disappeared with all the film. They'd lost the entire film. He took it with so they them. They financed and helped shoot a movie. They financed and, then and shot he just it, left and out. he just took it. Wait, and is it, do do we now discover? Do they do they find it ever, or so do they recreate it? So that was in 1992. Yeah. And about 10 years later, they get a package in the mail of videotapes, and they think it, and it says Shirkers, which is the name of the film they made, and they think, oh my God, he sent the film back. Every single videotape was blank. So it's kind of like a dick move, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing then happened until, I think it was 2011. Another 10 years. Uh, she had become a film critic. She had moved to LA and she got a call from this woman who said, my asshole husband died. My, there's 70 cans, rolls of film in this room. I don't know what to do. Do you want them back? It's your film. And she is reunited with the film she made when she was 19. Oh, my gosh. And out of that, she has cr created this whole documentary telling the story and showing 
the, the movie. Film, the bits of the film. Now, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Because I was going to say, it, 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 that's one of those things that when you uh, s- something happens at 19 and you build it up into your head that it was the best thing that ever happened, it was absolutely fantastic, da, da, da. but then when you actually watch it, it's usually pretty cringeworthy. That was my fear, that you think the things that we in our past were like, so amazing, oh, yeah. and they don't hold up. No, does it? Well, I think, you know, on the one hand, like being robbed of this year's worth of work, like it's just, that's a real tragedy. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, the twist is that they couldn't put the film back together because he had got rid of all the audio. So they're just left with all this silent film. And from looking at the film, you think, yeah, it's pretty good. But we'll never know it because the audio has gone. But why can't they get lip readers mm. and why can't they do a sound reproduction oh, of it? I don't know. Because they made the documentary instead. Mm. Well, I see documentary number two. <laughs> We bring sound, or we put. We should make it a silent movie. Mm-hmm. Sharkers too. Sh- yeah, I think there should be a sequel. I think it's- <laughs> shirkier. <laughs> Things just got shirkier. <laughs> Sharkers too. Sharkers 3D. And is that like time in the theaters? Or you don't know no, where Sharkers that is. is streaming on Netflix, and it's. Oh, okay. I think it, you know it, it's in the running for Academy consideration. Right. Okay. And before you say spoiler alert, you're going to forget what Fenton said. Just remember Shirkers, Netflix, and then just watch it. You're not going to remember. Um, we are just moments away from talking about the number one thing that made us go, wow. wow, this week. Don't go anywhere. It's the Wow Report on Radio Andy, Sirius XM. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. We're back. Uh, this is the Wow Report. I'm Tom Campbell here with James St. James, Fenton Bailey, Hi. and of course Blake. Hi. Um, we've been counting down the top ten things that make us go wow. wow. And now we're ready to announce number one. Number one. This week, tonight on VH1, is the return of RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars Four. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, <laughs> you know, just for full, di- you know, we obviously produce that show. But I have just to say, for those of you who love RuPaul's Drag Race, you're going to be very, very happy with the season. I happen to know people who work on it. And second, for mm-hmm. those of you who haven't watched RuPaul's Drag Race or just know a little bit about it, this is an excellent primer. It's an All Star season. Some of the best, That's of right, the best yeah. come together. And um, tell us who some tell, tell us who the people are. We have, I know we have Latrice, Latrice Royale. Uh huh. Oh my God, Trinity the Tuck. Oh. Pheromone. Oh. Gia Gunn. My God. Monet Exchange. Here we go. Monique Hart. <laughs> Holy Naomi Lord. Smalls. Wah. Jazz and Masters. Manila Luzon. And wait, 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 wait. And Valentina. Oh. That's an amazing cast. That is a really good cast. And I don't want, you know, it's, 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 for those who don't watch RuPaul's Drag Race, you just think, oh, it's a bunch of bitchy queens. It's actually got heart and soul and, and aspiration. But this is a group of outspoken queens, and they are not afraid to let each other have it. Are there some, some infighting and some, some bitchiness, or is there more of a love fest? Well, for it's, it's more the last. They, they really let it all hang out, which is what it's there for fun. They all do so well. Any queen, we're so proud to produce this show because all the queens on it are performers who, once they have that international platform, can take their art to all all different levels but this is the game show part this is the fun part where they're competing and uh you know and 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 all stars um you know has twists and turns of for the elimination so and there is a mid-season twist that <laughs> will change everything so you have to watch at least the first six episodes before you quit james and if you um, believe it that's only half of our number one and, and i just want to say and this is the other thing just for those of the skeptics not wanting to watch we have more is uh, is that our, our guest stars come and they spend like 14 hours in the set it's a long day but they come because they love the show and they love the queens this season just to give you an idea of who you'll be hanging with sierra casey musgraves who just won cma <gasps> yeah. like artist of the year uh, gus kenworthy Oh, and God. and Keenan uh, Longsdale from Love Simon is oh, beautiful. I love Zoe him. Kravitz is could you get hipper than Zoe Kravitz? Love is her. Also on the, uh, Vet Nicole Brown is hilarious. Cecily Strong from uh, SNL. Rita Ora, Suzanne Barsh oh, comes the Queen oh. of New York. Nicely, I mean, how we talk about Ellen Pompeo, uh, network's oh, number one love female me some star. Ellen Pompeo. Francis Bean Cobain. <gasps> Is there who knew <coughs> who knew when she's a little baby? Felicity Huffman, Jason Wu, and the premiere tonight. Could not. I, I was very excited when we got her, but I had no idea she'd be as good as she is. Jennifer Lewis. You won't have to go to church Wait, this weekend. Wait, little Jenny Lewis from, from tra- <laughs> True no. Beverly Hills. No, Jennifer Lewis oh. from Blackish yes, and, and the demon, the, the mother of Black Hollywood. Yes, Jennifer Lewis. Who is also Shangela's. Uh, yes. 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 And Jennifer Lewis is. You won't Jeez. have to go to church. She she <clears throat> brings you to church. She's an amazing person. 
Fenton over here is just about to expire. Um, and the she other... was amazing at the Emmys, wasn't she? Yes, she was. She wore the, I the actually Nike. went to a book reading that, that she went to, and she came in, and there was about five people in the audience, and she put on a Broadway show, and she sang, and she danced, and she yeah. talked, and she raised the roof. And by the end, everyone was crying and hugging each other. It was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that's what's happening tonight yeah. on RuPaul's Drag yeah, she's Race amazing. All-Stars 4 on VH1 at 8 o'clock. Watch it, DVR it. Go to any gay bar, any place in the United States, and they'll be watching it, too. Um, so... Who is our resistor of the week? Our resistor of the week, if I may, is the persons of the year at Time Magazine. Time Magazine outdid themselves, and they talked about the free press, and they talked yeah. specifically, they have four different covers, but the one that brought tears to my eyes was... Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah, because, you know, there's so much going on in the world at such a fast, awful pace in politics that you I try to find, shield myself from it to a certain degree. And I know his story, and it's so gruesome, and the bone, and the premeditation, and the fact I that Jared... I can't breathe, I can't yes, breathe. and that Jared know. Kushner was then talking to the prince... Texting every day, how saying... How to take care of this yeah, situation. Mm -hmm. But it brought tears to my eyes, because he really is a martyr. He was a, a, someone who was, who was killed and disposed of because of the power of free speech and his desire to exercise it. Well, I, I tend to think of him as the Archduke Ferdinand of, of our time, where he, I think he is the beginning of a long chain of dominoes that is yeah. going to culminate in something it's bad. It's really unbelievable. And there are yeah. other stories and other journalists from around the world that oh. they also feature. So four different covers. Journal yeah, and but that's the one that struck me as, as it, just, it just reminded me of of the brutality in this world and how I know brutality has been going on since the Old Testament since the end of time well, but yeah. our, our desire to, to, to let it pass but you, but you think that we've, we've okay, grown and we've, we've changed we, and we, we haven't try to rise above yeah. it anyway yeah. happy happy <laughs> oh I'm acting like it's over so that's what we have we've done it we've completed the show uh, Fenton's voice Fenton will be back next week and hopefully his uh, voice will be back too uh, and if we're lucky James <laughs> will lose his voice uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding Blake, thank you as always. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank um, you guys. We're always happy to do this. Thank you, Andy. Happy holidays, everyone. Take a moment before we see you again. Take a little time to enjoy the view and do something that makes the world go. Oh. Wow. wow. Bye.